thank you once again for being with us uh, today for the uh, Robot Policy Forum. Uh, let me first welcome and thank Dr. Mohamed Shraqawi for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Shraqawi, as I said first, uh, he has a dual affiliation. He's a professor of conflict resolution at George Mason University in the United States of America and the um, uh, has a second affiliation with Al Jazeera Center for Studies. Without further ado, let me pass the uh, floor to Dr. Mohammed Shakawi. Dr. Mohammed Shakawi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. أشكر سي إبراهيم وأود أن أشكر الدكتور مصباح وفريق المعهد المغربي لتحليل السياسات شكرا مضاعفا أولا للتفكير في محور له رهينته وأيضا له حاجة نقدية مهمة ينبغي أن نواجه ما تشهده الساحة الآن من خلال طرح نقدي مستقل لا منتمي لا متحزب وأيضا مسؤول مدنيا سياسيا وأخلاقيا أشكره أيضا وأشكر الفريق مرة أخرى على وضع أول معهد أبحاث بروح يمكن أن نسميها روح ونفس دولي بمعنى الاستفادة من تجارب مراكز الأبحاث في العالم وهو محاولة إيجاد مركز عربي باللغة الإنجليزية على خارطة مغربية من منطلق مغربي من الداخل إلى الخارج فأعتقد أن هذه ليست فقط مجرد إضافة بل هو تأسيس حقيقي لأننا ابتعدنا كثيرا عن العالم ركزنا على من حان الفرنكوفوني وحان الوقت أن ندخل الفكر العالمي برؤى مغربية لا انفتاح على العالم وليس على جغرافيا موحدة أشكرهم وبالنظر إلى أن بيننا مجموعة من الضيوف من خارج المغرب وأيضا بيننا مجموعة من الطلاب الذين أصبحوا يتحدثون الإنجليزية أفضل منا فأقترح أن ألقي ما أقترح عليكم باللغة الإنجليزية وهناك ترجمة فورية فإذا I'm going to talk in English and as you see my topic is social capital between state and society and outside in reflection رأس المال الاجتماعي بين الدولة والمجتمع تأملات من الخارج إلى الداخل I would like to start with a quote from the book The, Social, the Sociological Imagination written by American sociologist C. Wright Mills in 1959. He wrote, Neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both. Mills believed sociology could show us the society, not our own foibles and failings, is responsible for many of our problems. One of the main tasks of sociology, as he would argue, is to transform personal problems into public and political issues. He expected the sociological imagination to be, as he wrote, the vivid awareness of the relationship between experience and the wider society. These quotes may sound inspiring to us in shaping a rather multidisciplinary approach and embracing the need for addressing both agency and structure, while probing into the detractors of the expected governance and polity in Morocco. This call for a holistic perspective can also be motivating for us to move out of our academic silos and contribute to a well-nuanced analysis of the performance of Moroccan institutions. As we have entered the new year, 
there are fresh indicators of more than one trend in the loss or at least decline of Morocco's social capital in both political and societal dimensions. Some questions are timely and daunting. What has undermined the social capital between society and state in recent years? How has this decline moved in both vertical and horizontal directions? What indicators should one present to make such a claim without sounding alarmist or conspiratorial? To capture the interconnectedness between Moroccans' personal experiences, public mood and politics, or the agency structure connection, we need to step beyond our academic comfort zones, or what our francophone friends would call specialité. Instead, complexity theory provides us with an explanatory framework for the study of how individuals and organizations interact, relate, and evolve within a larger social ecosystem. As Eve Middleton Kelly of the London School of Economics would argue, complexity explains why interventions may have an anticipated consequences, the intricate interrelationships of elements within a complex system gives rise to multiple chains of dependencies. Accordingly, I argue for better collaboration between theories of the person, theories of structure, and findings of the field work to help address how and why trust has turned to, into distrust in Moroccan political institutions. There is growing disarticulation between state and society what calls for a well-bridged collaboration across social sciences with well-informed insights. I like to perceive us in this room not as distant academic tribes, but rather as one league of open-minded analysts with, with competitive hypotheses and critical perspectives. Beyond the ego-driven constraints of the so-called speciality. The challenge is quite laborious as we look at the big elephant in the room. The deepening social malaise and popular resentment of what has become accusative and transformative politics and discourse of blame among the monarchy, the government, the political parties, the financial elite, and the whole establishment. In recent years, there has been a pattern of dysfunctionality in several sectors of public life and widening gap between people's expectations and the state's performance. We ought not to shy away from deconstructing this dilemma under any pretext of political correctness or avoidance of critical thinking. Today, in this conference, I believe we have a common task of addressing two imperatives to the best of our capabilities. First, to perform an accurate sociological diagnosis of the Moroccan political societal diagnosis and disjoint, disjoint between text and practice, body and soul, discourse and trajectory. There are various tools of social science at our hands, from social psychology to political sociology, from the basic human needs paradigm to macroeconomics, and from real politics to the theories of social movement and collective action. Along the parallel lines between the official discourse and popular narratives that are flooding social media, there are more divergences 
which raise new questions about the fluctuations of the social capital driven by several domestic, regional and international dynamics. The second task is to develop in ourselves the confidence of being schizophrenic and acting with two personalities at once. Some of you by now may think the conference organizers have made a big mistake by inviting an individual with a mental disorder or has lost, lost touch with reality to deliver a keynote speech. Well, let me address and confess to you. I am truly schizophrenic by necessity not to lose touch with this reality while seeking deep analysis of the status quo Morocco. Therefore, I invite you all to wear two hats. One of the academic scholar who is well versed in the literature and methodology of his or her respective field of study. The second is of the curious practitioner, field worker, ethnographer in capturing the deep-seated and rooted causes of the puzzle that, and eliminating the wrong hypothesis. We need to reconcile the theory-practice question by opening space for them to move freely toward each other in both directions. This is our point of entry into validating any hypothesis about the tension between two forces, top-down status quo versus bottom-up call for change before we can make any predictions about the trajectory of Morocco's social change. Let me go back to Mills. He perceived the sociological imagination as a critical quality of mind. And he says, as it enables us to grasp history and biography and the relations between the two within society. This is its task and its promise. So be prepared to wear a possible free hat by the end of my talk. First, let me contextualize the term social capital around the main question, what capital? No, no, you went too far. You went too far. Go back. Yeah, stay here. So let's address the question, what capital, what decline? In the last three years, several European and American scholars have contributed to social capital theory, namely Paul, Pierre Bourdieu in sociology, 1984, Robert Putnam, Hamid mentioned earlier in Political Science, 93-96, James Coleman in Education Psychology, 1988, and Francis Fukuyama in Economic History, 1996. For instance, Putnam argued social capital enhances the benefits of investment in physical and human capital and consists of social networks which he perceives as a set of horizontal associations between people. Other theorists like Janet Holland have positioned social capital between an integration model and a model of injustice and inequality. Social capital also represents the sum of social stability and the well-being either perceived or real of the entire population and generate social cohesion and a certain level of consensus which is which in turn delivers a stable environment for the economy. However, as Oxford scholar and former director of the development research group at the World Bank, Paul Collier believes social capital needs not be confined to those social interactions which have unintended economic effects. He asserts the broadest definition of social capital includes government, since the contribution of government to income is to realize benefits which would not be achieved through 
the market and these benefits will be durable because government is itself durable. The emphasis is on the role of the government here Echo, echoes the significance of gratifying basic human needs, a well-embraced theory in social psychology and conflict studies in the last seven decades. Within this context, social capital sets the level of trust in the system, the establishment and the entire social organization model. Trust remains a very dynamic variable in the process and is shaped not only by those social cultural networks but also by public perceptions and reactions. We need therefore to invoke social constructivism here to help us map out both structure and agency dynamics. British sociologist Anthony Giddens asserts actors are reflexive and their reflexivity is an aspect of social action and thus part of structuration. We leave yeah. No, this is Paul Collier. Okay, from the little good school thing. We, as we live at the age of robust social action and protest politics, one should not underestimate the centrality of trust and social capital in the analysis of the Moroccan case, where neither micro nor macro focused analysis alone would be sufficient. Individuals, advocacy groups, and local civil society are contesting the monopoly of Mahzen and the so called servants of the state in reproducing the traditional power relations. We are, they are coming to the fore to be part of the process of reforming, remodeling, and modernizing the existing structure. What matters here is neither the agency of the individual nor the power of the structure, but the relational dimension and the outcome of interactivity. This brings us to the concept of duality of structure. Edens has formulated this duality as being the essential recursiveness of social life as constituted in social practices. Structure is both medium and outcome of reproduction of practices. Structure enters simultaneously into the constitution of the agent and social practice and exists in the generating moments of this constitution. With the, with the addition of an economic lens into the social cultural perspective, the study of social capital remains problematic. It is not a tangible value and therefore is hard to measure and evaluate in numeric values. Recent research has shaped new denomin denominations of human capital, physical capital, economic capital, and cultural capital. However, the difficulty of shaping the numeric valuation of Morocco's social capital should not stop us from embracing triangulation as a power technique in the process of validating recent data from internal and external sources, as well as combining both quantitative and qualitative tracks of inquiry. I reject the notion of studying Morocco through the prism of the analytical prototype of a post-2011 uprising or Arab Spring reality. In the last seven years, Moroccan developments either as proactive mode of popular collective action or reactive Mahzani management of the crisis should not be a generic subject matter like in other Arab nations. Instead, I argue for the differentiation, differentiation between two eras of turbulent politics. The first lasted between February 2011 and October 2016, after activists took to the street in Tangier, Rabat, and elsewhere, like any other Arab capitals, changing their demands and putting pressure on the government to fulfill certain specific reforms. Since then, the Moroccan pursuit of reform and democratization remains a 1,000 and one night cliffhanger.
The second era started in October 2016 with the death of Mohsen Fikri in a garbage truck in Husayma. This particular incident served as a trigger event of reviving the melancholic mutual legacy between the state in Rabat and the sizable Rifi demography in the north and its disgruntled diaspora in Europe. Herak Rif has invigorated the generations transmitted trauma of discrimination between Al Maghrib and Nafa, war in Morocco and Al Maghrib Ghair and Nafa or Al Nafa, the non the non war in Moroccans and also the nineteen eighty four stigmatization of Rifis as a bash of savages. Herak has also accentuated the question about the promised governance and the state's role in abusing its own political capital and trust. Consequently, Morocco's social Dow Jones has struggled in making any upward strides. Institutionalism and other top-down real politics schools of thought in Rabat seem to have exhausted their zeal in maintaining popular subordination, allegiance, nationalism, legitimacy, and other assets of the political capital. In contrast, there has been an unprecedented frequency of protests in Husayma, Jarada, Gulmim, strikes of doctors and workers in other sectors, muqata'a or boycott of several items, several brands, and other expressions of deepening social malaise. This growing tide of collective action or people politics has entailed a shortage of political innovation and therefore reproduction of the same classical discourse. In October 2017, the King's promise of a possible political earthquake sounded promising in installing a mechanism of productivity and accountability. However, the discourse of blame, politics, and the security legal paradigm in which the political establishment has invested heavily in the last two years have been more symbolic than pragmatic in dealing with those incidents which remain the iceberg of deeper social malaise. A recent study commissioned by the state-funded Conseil Economique Social, a environmental Marocain, describes how deep malaise has spread among the youth more than other segments of society. Two-thirds of young Moroccans between the age of 15 and 34 are out of school. 20% are unemployed. 50% are on low pay. 82% are not physically active. 75% have no social security coverage and 20% suffer psychological disorders. Concisely, two out of three young Moroccans have abandoned their studies and one out of five suffers from mental health issues. The lack of interest in political participation is striking. Only one belongs to a one percent belongs to a political party or syndicate. Moreover, ninety one percent of professionals aged fifty 35 and younger wish to work abroad in search for better work conditions and quality of life, including health care comfort, and thus contributing to Morocco's brain drain. To say the situation is bleak is an understatement. Local observers have pointed to several social fractures in recent years. Moroccan economist Larbi Jaidi explains how the income of 10% of the well-off is over 12.7 times than that of 10% of the poorest. 
the quintal of the richest population already accounts for 48% of the total income against 6.5% for the poorest quintal. As he concluded, the homogenization of society around the middle class is hindered by the reproduction of social inequalities. This seems to reflect Moroccan disparity between the 90% versus 1% global show down or the have-nots and have-mores in a society that lacks opportunities for social mobility with a miniature middle class. According to the United Nations Development Program, and I am honored to have in the audience a good friend of mine, Sam Shortawi, who happens to work with this organization in the Gulf, and I think he has better statistics than mine, but he can always say, well, I can help you with more. So, the overall unemployment rate is 9.3%. However, it jumps to 18% among the youth between 14 and 25. Homicide rate is 1.2 per 100,000 Moroccans. The country's human development index stood at 0 0.667, ranking number 123rd among other nations according to the UNDP report released in September 2018. Let's move to the International Organization for Migration that highlights that Spain recorded more than 38,000 arrivals by sea and land in 2018. About 7,000 of them were Moroccans, mainly youth Moroccans. Meanwhile, the Moroccan authorities foiled 54,000 attempts to cross the Mediterranean from their shores. In one incident, a Moroccan, young, a Moroccan Navy ship opened fire on a speedboat transporting 20 people and a young girl, Hayat, was killed. Her death triggered deep sorrow and resonance among most of the Moroccan youth. An article published last October with the title Young, Educated, Desperate to Emigrate captured the common feeling of despair and hopelessness. I quote one sentence. You can either stay and rot to death with no dignity and no opportunities or die on the way out in the so-called death box. Last November, the London-based Legatum Institute, which assesses how prosperity is forming and changing across the world, captured I'm sorry, published its 2018 Prosperity Index. Morocco ranking, ranked 103rd among 148 countries and scored the lowest in governance, education, personal freedom, and social capital. Morocco's position has declined eight spots down. It's going south eight spots down in comparison with number 95 in 2008. A separate study known as Social Capital World Ranking Index issued its 2017 report that covered 180 countries. Morocco came 160th, 160, with a score of 37.1 behind Zimbabwe and the 122nd position, Kenya the 80th and Spain the 37th. In Germany, the Bertslam Transformation Index has studied consensus building between political and civil society players in 129 nations in 2018 and rated them on a scale of 1 to 10. Morocco ranks number 83 with 4.6 behind Algeria, Tunisia, Jordan, Iraq, and Kuwait. In terms of performance and commitment to democratic institutions, the score is lower with two points, political participation three, and political and social capital four. 
Last week, the Economist Intelligence Unit released its 2018 Global Democracy Index after studying 167 nations using 60 indicators across, yeah, we can, no, just, no, go back, sorry, go back into the last one, yeah. Okay, across five broad categories, electoral, No, I think after the no, the next one. Yeah, this one. This one. Yeah. So let's look at those five categories: electoral process and pluralism, the function of government, political participation, democratic political capture, and civil liberties. Yeah. Morocco ranks 100 out of 165 countries with 4.99 points out of 10. It is considered one of the hybrid systems between authoritarian regimes and flawed democracies. The Economist predicts Morocco would continue to struggle with social unrest. It is unlikely that the underlying causes of the rift unrest, such as the entanglement of politics and the big business of, and widespread inequality, will be fully addressed in the near term. The internal, these internal and external indicators point to a variety of challenges the Moroccan establishment needs to address in 2019 and beyond. Let me highlight three specific, I know we are running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. So let me address three specific drivers of the conflict or the crisis. Let's put the next one. One I call an AH dilemma. Second, simultaneous vertical and horizontal erosion of social capital. And third, solidification of protracted social confidence. A few words about each of these categories. The dilemma, the H dilemma, is Hogra, Harayk, and Hashtag. The Moroccan youth have internalized these three constructs with traumatic connotations within the H dilemma. Hogra, a sense of powerlessness and deprivation of dignity. Hareg is an immigration alternative and the pursuit of crossing to Europe even in a risky journey in the death boats and hashtag as a conduit of venting on social media. This is an understudies barometer of, for growing social malaise. Digital channels and videos circulating on YouTube and Facebook have had incredible reach and defied certain classical taboos and fear of the power centers in Rabat. In, let me move to the erosion, both vertical and horizontal. In the last two years, the social capital decline represents a tree that hides a forest in Morocco. We are now at an, an interlocking point of two negative trends of this decline. One is vertical and the other is horizontal. The vertical decline is political between society and state. Since late 2016, the political establishment has increasingly struggled to maintain its haba, prestige and fear. According to the Arab Trends Project, trust in Morocco, in Moroccan political institutions is among the lowest in the Middle East and North Africa. Larbi Jaidi points to a political practice that perpetuates the rules governing the functioning of a core society not only, not only limits itself to weakening the relations with of the government with the royal power but reproduces but reproduces the functioning of a system built upon clientelism neo patrimonialism and the use of politics for financial gain this vertical decline correlates with the regression of the national identity into nurturing sub identities Amazir versus Arab, Rif versus Ayesha, Islamist versus modernist, people versus Mahzan, and so on and so on and so on. The horizontal erosion is also significant. It is societal or intra society. Social trust is very low among Moroccans. More than 80% believe that most people cannot be trusted according to BTI index. 
let us not ignore the ramifications of the fact that 20% of Moroccans suffer from psychological disorders. In 2017, the Moroccan authorities catalogued 559,035 crimes, 18% in murders, 4% in robberies, and 3% in rapes. The cases of rape heard by Moroccan courts doubled in 2018 to 1,600 cases. Only in Morocco, with the so-called Haqqawi law, it takes a whistle to fight sexual harassment against women at public places. Social and political capital tends to be hard to earn but easy to spend. The erosion of this capital depends on having trouble with the boss here. Is it to spend? The erosion of social capital deepens tr distrust in the state and pushes citizens to regroup in social networks at the golden age of collective action. These networks have embraced communication technology with no physical addresses. The system of Admin, Shiuch, and Piyad, and the entire state bureaucracy and security apparatus does not seem to be well prepared to contain let alone to control the dynamics of these emerging social networks. The public sphere is embroiled in in-group confrontations and is constructing alternative bonds of various malaise driven regroupings and solidarities. My last point, solidification of a protracted social conflict, is trends of decline in both political and intra-society capital entail latent escalation of Moroccan conflict. The mix of failing socio-economic policies, religiosity, and real politics has led to negative shifts into societal cohesion and deepened disarticulation between state and society within the multi-communal Moroccan society. While developing his new PSC, Protracted Social Conflict Theory, in 1990, Arab-American conflict theorist Edward Azar argued the process of protracted social conflict deforms and retards the effective operation of political institutions. It reinforces and strengthens pessimism throughout society, demoralizing, demoralizes leaders, and immobilizes the search for peaceful solutions. We have observed that societies undergoing protracted social conflict find it difficult to initiate the search for answers to their problems and grievances. Apparently, Morocco is at this stage of political fatigue and loss of compass. In concluding, Morocco remains captive of a battle between two rival legitimacies, one bottom-up legitimacy that derives from popular grievances of basic human needs and demands for reform versus a top-down legitimacy that echoes the state institutionalism, the rule of law, and other frames of the power paradigm. The analysis of this recent protest slogans on social media content indicates how the bottom-up demands and act of accountability have ha gone higher than the political parties and government. It has become common conviction the buck stops with the monarchy. Looking forward, I cannot stress enough the need for shifting the unit of analysis from institutions and systems to the human dimension. One needs to stand at the intersection between individuals and institutions, between state and society, and reflect on how social change shapes itself. To help address the problem of distrust in the political systems and institutions, we need to wear a third hat, as I mentioned earlier, as we aim hopefully at this conference and beyond to do a thorough sociological diagnosis reconnect text to reality and rekindle the missing love between society and state, we need to be trusted and reliable mediators between society and state <coughs> by providing non-partisan perspectives on how to shape sound public policies in the future. This is the moral imagination of the intellectuals when they decide to engage with their societies and help design a vision of change 
and a compass for the road. We can be a catalyst force of reason and critical thinking to help initiate a new chapter between the top and the bottom. I like to leave you with one question, one reflection. Do we have a Moroccan sociological imagination? Thank you.